Good morning, House of Praise family. Pastor Steve here, and Happy New Year to everybody. I trust that everybody had a wonderful Christmas season over the last week or two, and uh, I know it's been a difficult time for some, but Lord is good, and He's going to get us through, and uh, I just know that God's got good things in store for every one of us. So, uh, Carol and I have had a few things to deal with, too, so we understand and uh, but God but God as we often say and God will get us through and everything's going to work together for good I have a message for you here this morning since we're going to go online here this morning on this YouTube premiere I trust that you're with us and remember you have the live chat available to you so you can enter in and speak to the people in the church and also back and forth with Carol and I and feel free to do that if you'd like to do it and uh uh, just just be sure to uh, communicate and communicate clearly. It's nice to let everybody know you're on, for example. And, uh, and then if you have any other comments or questions, you can do that. And, and then uh, if there's an overwhelming amount that I can't handle during the message, then I will obviously do it afterwards. But in any, in any case, we will take care of uh, any of questions that you may have on the message or whatever. So God bless you all. We love you all. And uh, I'm excited about this message. We've been talking about the love of God over the last few weeks, and you know that. In fact, we actually started out uh, part one, we called it, uh, talking about a, uh, the wonderful different words that are used for love in the Bible and uh, Greek words that we're talking about. And uh, we talked about eros and storage, phileo, and... Uh, Ludius and also Philautia and Pragma and Agape. Uh, these are wonderful Greek words that are really, uh, really explain the love of God in a in a very unique way and in ways that our English language doesn't do a very good job sometimes. And just the one word explains many different kinds of love, and where the Greek words get into a lot more detail so that was really a good thing we did take a closer look and a little preliminary look on agape love which is the most important of all of them and that's the God kind of love and uh, we also uh, in part two we we looked at a little bit more detail of uh, some parts of agape love and the source of it that's really key the source of the agape love is really important. We know the source is by the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's all through Jesus Christ. So I'm really excited about that, and I trust that each and every one of us will take uh, the initiative, the time, the energy, uh, the investment, if you will, in this new year. I know this is my heart cry, that in this new year, I will apply every part of everything that we have done and taught this past year and a lot of really good things we went over and and, uh, and and went through even during this pandemic and during the lockdown time and we covered a lot of good things but but this is really I think the most important thing that we talked about last year and uh, the most important thing we can talk about this year is the love of God remember there's only two things that are important like I said before it's, it's vertical love and horizontal love it's love for God, love for each other, and every other virtue hangs off of those two Christian virtues. So uh, if we can certainly get those two down, <laughs> if we can get those two down, we've got everything. And um, so that's what Jesus said. There's only two things that are really important. We, we also talked about in part three of this series, a really important section on 10 ways how to express agape love. That was really a powerful time, and um, we got notes and and uh, YouTube's of these as well. And then the last section, section four, we talked about love deficiencies. Remember that a couple of weeks ago? We actually looked at 25 love deficiencies, ways that we can have a deficiency in love that needs to be nourished, needs to be brought back to life, needs to be revived. Okay, if we have a deficiency in our health, we do things to to try to compensate for that's why we take supplements and uh, that's why we may eat certain things that are more healthy or whatever well it's the same way with our spiritual interests 
and if we're a little bit short on love, there's ways that we can correct that. So we talked about a lot of those things and that was all good. In this section, we wanna just focus a little bit closer on agape love. And, and I know that we've got so much here to cover. Uh, the Lord is just going to give us wisdom on how to approach this this year so that it's not just a message, not just a sermon. That, that's never my desire. My desire always is to provide nourishment to the soul, nourishment to our spirit so that we can really be uh, changed, so that I can be changed. I know uh, those who are, you know, uh, who serve the fruit out, so to speak. It says in the word of God, are the first partaker. So I'm gonna be the first partaker of this fruit for sure. And I want to apply this to my life like never before. That's my heart cry. So I'm gonna share a few things with you here this morning. And I trust that everybody is in tune now if you have your Bibles and let's just take a moment to pray. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the privilege that we can gather together online for these few moments here this morning. Nourish our soul, Lord, and touch us, Father, so that we can hear your voice. Oh God, touch our spiritual ears and our hearts so that we can receive the Word of God, so that the Word of God will have a, a major effect on us, oh God, so that we will be changed, Lord. Start with me. I want to be changed, oh God. I want to be filled with your Spirit, filled with the love of God. I want to understand and, and apply this this coming year in 2021 more than ever before in my life. So God, make this a good time together as we are together online on this Sunday morning and I believe it's what, uh, January the 3rd. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. So God bless you all. We're gonna look a little closer this morning and uh, 1 Corinthians the 13th chapter is where we're gonna go. And what a powerful revelation the apostle Paul had. If I could speak with all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love one another and did not have a love for my brothers or my sisters, it would be just making me like a noisy gong, it says, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, just a lot of noise. Okay, I could, I could speak in tongues, I can have a great intellect, speak in languages of the earth, which would be learned languages, like the English language or whatever, Spanish or whatever it may be, or of angels, which is that heavenly language, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit allows us to do that. But even if I spoke in those languages and don't know how to love, I'm still nothing. If I had the gift of prophecy, boy, this is key because the Apostle Paul said, I would that you would all prophesy. And if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith so that I could remove a mountain, imagine measuring your faith against that, to being able to be moved, uh, move a mountain. And if I didn't love others, I would still be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, imagine this. I could boast about it, but if I didn't love, didn't know how to forgive, didn't know how to be kind to each other, didn't know how to express agape love in a powerful way, it would be still nothing, still nothing. And then this is really, this is crucial guys to be able to grasp this this morning. And I know we all have a mental ascent to these scriptures and we have a general idea but I'm telling you right now, we need the Holy Spirit to make them real to us so that we can apply them right away, but into this coming year. You know, love is greater than spiritual gifts, as powerful and as wonderful as spiritual gifts are. In these three verses, Paul mentions six spiritual gifts. He talks about tongues, prophecy, knowledge, faith, giving, and even martyrdom, yes, and the first four gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians and the 12th chapter, the 8th through the 10th verses. Paul kicks off the first verse with the gift of tongues when he writes, if I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels. I'm re-emphasizing that, and yet I don't have love. I become like a noisy gong or just a clanging cymbal. I'm just a lot of noise. Paul mentions five more spiritual gifts when he writes, if I can even have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and knowledge, if I have faith, so that I can remove mountains and do not have love, I am still I am still nothing. If I give all my possessions even to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body even to be burned and do not have love, it still profits me nothing. Boy, I'll tell you, I, I don't know how this revelation could be explained in a more profound way than what the Apostle Paul did here. 
prophecy refers to the ability to declare God's truth in powerful, life-changing ways. Amen. I can explain prophecy in a lot of ways. This is a simplistic way that God has given me. Knowledge involves the deep understanding of the Word of God. Amen. And we need to have that. We've got to get certainly from our mind into our heart, of course. And it's so important that we get it into our spirit. Faith is the unique ability to trust God for great things, even though we can't see, we can't feel, yet understand and know that he is still working. These three gifts are all from the Holy Spirit, and yet without the love who has them is still nothing. This is a profound revelation, and I'm going to keep on saying that to you so that you can get that into your spirit. Now we're going to go into the fourth verse, and the fourth verse, and the five, uh, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, really explains love in a different way that actually is 15 separate portraits of love. And we want to look at this, Lord, in the name of Jesus, give us revelation here this morning. Love is patient and kind. Love is never jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of wrongs. This is so crucial. Amen. It does not rejoice about injustice, but always rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Boy, that, that is just one way of expressing this, and now we're going to look a little bit deeper down. Love is expressed in supernatural responses coming through our soul. Amen. We have a revelation of the love of God in our spirit, but we need to get it into the mind, the will, and the emotions so that we can express it. Okay? Supernatural responses, I'm calling these. Okay? Love is a word that can only be properly defined in terms of action. Action. Okay? It's a verb. To love is a verb. It's also a noun, but better expressed as a verb, an attitude, a behavior. Paul has no room for abstract theoretical definitions. He cuts right to the chase. Instead, he wants us to know what love looks like when we see it. So when we look at a person, we say, that's love. I know when we look at Jesus Christ, we'll say, that's what love looks like. That's what agape looks like. And we should be in a position with our maturity in our church, we should be able to say, look at that person, that's what love looks like. That's what love sounds like. That's the way love is expressed. And that's why I'm saying love is an action verb. Thus he paints 15 separate portraits of love, which we'll go over here quickly, and then in another message, we'll define them a little bit more. Imagine. In four short verses, the Apostle Paul, in four short verses, okay, uses 15 verbs, all of which have love as their subject. In the biblical definition of agape love, love acts, and love is an action, not an emotion, okay? So it's not responding to an emotion, it's a willful act, amen. Verse four begins by summarizing the unselfish nature of love. Love is patient. The Greek language has several words for patience, and one signifies patience with circumstances, while others is only used in reference to patience with people. And they're really two different situations. The Lord knows we need both kinds of patience. But it is the second word that we find the greatest meaning here. The King James Version renders this as a word that means long-suffering, okay? I like this. Paul seems to be saying that love does not have a short fuse, okay? Does not have a short fuse. It doesn't lose its temper easily. A person who exercises agape love does not lose patience with people. Love never says, well, I'll give you one more chance, then that's it. Love never does that. Love is kind. Number two, this is important. Patience must be accompanied by a positive reaction of goodness toward the other person. Kindness, however, is not to be equated with just giving everyone what he or she wants. Sometimes love must be tough. Amen. And that is true. In the context of the church, kindness may mean 
forcing an addict to go through uh, the, the difficulties of withdrawal, addiction withdrawal. That's very painful. And I've worked with many, many people that have had to do that. Kindness may mean saying to a spoiled child, no, you can't have this, you can't do this. That's kindness. Kindness is, is rearing a spoiled child and, and steering them back into a right relationship with the parents so that that child will obey out of love and respect and not being forced to do it. Kindness means to withhold what harms as well as give what heals. Okay, to withhold what would harm, but to give what heals. That's what kindness is. To withhold what harms, but give what heals. Love is kind, but it's often tough. Paul followed these two positive expressions of love with eight verbs that indicate how it does not behave, okay? Love is not jealous. Jealousy implies being displeased with the success of someone else, okay? Or the blessings of another person, amen? Yet true love desires the success of others. The best way to cure envy is to pray sincerely for the person for which you are jealous. To pray for him or her is to demonstrate love, and jealousy and love cannot exist in the same heart. I really do believe that. Love does not brag or boast. The root word for brag in Greek is very picturesque and is closest to our English word, which means windbag. Believe it or not, amen? Love is not egotistical. Love is not big-headed, but big-hearted. And I hope that you're grasping this this morning. This means the more loving you become, the less boasting you need to do. The greater your spiritual gifts, the less prone you should be to brag, amen? After all, the gifts have been graciously given to you by God. They're a gift from God. And when you and I brag, we are demonstrating our insecurity and our spiritual immaturity. Amen. So I know that that's never the will of God, that we should have that spirit and that attitude. Paul states that bragging is a converse of biblical love. Hence, we should pursue Christ so that we will be humble before him and others. Humility is a huge part of learning how to love God. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Make me a humble man, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Humility is a huge part of Christian maturity. Now the next attribute here is love is not arrogant, okay? The term arrogant refers to a, a grasping for power, amen? It is more serious than bragging, which is often just grasping for praise, okay? Grasping for praise versus uh, having a, a very serious grasp on trying to have power. Arrogance is really very ungodly. Arrogant people push themselves into leadership, using people as stepping stones. And I've seen that many times in the business world. And, and always considers themselves exempt from the requirements. It's the double standard situation that we see in our country and among political arenas many times, that there's a double standard. And double standards are never good and they're never godly. Amen? Arrogance disrespects others and carries a disdain for others. And God calls us to serve others and to be gracious toward them. So you can see the difference where agape love is never an arrogant person. Love does not act rude. Rudeness is so ungodly. There are many Christians who seem to take delight in being blunt. Okay? Being blunt and justifying it like on the grounds of honesty, quote unquote, and they will say, I'm just telling it like it is, okay? But love doesn't always tell it like it is. It doesn't always verbalize all its thoughts, particularly if those thoughts don't build others up. The Word of God clearly tells us to edify the body of Christ, to build the body of Christ up, to build each other up, not to tear each other down, not to throw each other under the bus, so to speak, Amen. There is graciousness in love, which never forgets that courtesy, tact, and politeness are really lovely things. And it's the love of God being expressed. Love is not self-focused and does not insist on its own rights. That's huge right now. That is huge. Needless to say, this is a rare quality today. Ours is a society in which Self-seeking is not only tolerated, but it's even advocated. 
okay? It, it's called entitlement thinking, saying I deserve this and I deserve that, or you owe me, or you owe me this and that and the other, okay? Love is never self-focused and does not insist on that type of thing, does not insist on its own rights. You can go to any bookstore and pick up titles like Winning Through Intimidation, Looking Out for Number One, okay, or Creative Aggression. These are, these are titles of books that literally teach you how to be this way, how to be rude and how to be arrogant and how to be in the, have entitlement thinking. These are all ungodly attributes, and when we're studying the love of God, we're looking at agape love, we can see the great contrast between the love of God and these kind of behaviors. Amen. A self-absorbed narcissist person or narcissistic person cannot act in love. Love is not possessive, it's not demanding, it's not stubborn or dominating. Love is never condescending on others. Love is not always, you know, looking for ways to throw somebody under the bus, so to speak. Love does not talk uh, too much, but aggressively listens. The agape love of God will be a good listener and interrupting them before they're done and then trying to, uh, you know, just kind of prepare what you're saying instead of aggressively listening to what they're saying. Okay? A person filled with the love of God will be a good listener. Will be a good listener. And that's really important to learn to show sincere interest in other people. Love does not assist on its own way and it will always be willing to defer to others. Amen. Love is not easily provoked or made irritated or touchy or angry. Okay. Love is not given to emotional outburst. Just not that way. It's, uh, it's not exasperated by petty annoyances, but refuses to walk in that level of immaturity. That, that's a, that's a, immature view of life and uh, you know easily angry easily provoked easily irritated touchy always being offended agape love is not easily offended amen wonderful attributes that we're looking at here today and this is all from revelation out of first corinthians the 13th chapter one english version translates this virtue is love is not touchy do you know people who are so quick to take offense that you have to handle them with kid gloves or like you're walking on raw eggs around them all the time? Do you try to avoid talking to them when you can avoid it no longer? You carefully measure every word you say to make sure that you say exactly what you mean because they're going to be coming down on you and it's going to be a real problem because uh, they're going to condescend on you in some way, okay? But still the person seizes upon something and twists it into making you look bad. And that will happen. I've seen that happen over and over again. That kind of person knows nothing of agape love. Amen. And agape love is not touchy and it's not easily offended. We need to turn our offenders off. Amen. Love does not keep an account of wrong suffered, and it doesn't write down each uh, inquiry done and, and keep the account open to be settled someday, so to speak, okay? I know some people who are not only account, accomplished bookkeepers on the wrongs of others, but they actually have reminders, okay, that they give others. And, and uh, you know, I, I guess the question is, that, you know, are you keeping a book on someone? Are you, are you keeping a record of other people's wrongs? And, or are you being patient, loving, and kind? Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Amen. One of the reasons I, I detest watching the news uh, is that the bulk of the stories uh, concerning people's misfortunes and misdeeds and mistakes that are made. There is something in our human nature that causes our attention to be drawn to evil and dark things. Okay, this is uh, you know natural disasters and human tragedies. Love is not like that. Amen. Love takes no joy in any evil of any kind. It takes no malicious pleasure when it hears about inadequacies or mistakes or sins of someone else. Love is never a gossip. Never wants to talk about other people when it comes to negativity. Love is righteous. Amen. Love rejoices with the truth. If an action does not conform to the truth of God's word, it can't be done in love. Truth and love go together like hand in glove. Truth must make our love discriminating, 
but it also, the love, it makes our truth compassionate and forgiving. In other words, it's truth and love go together. Let me read that note again. This is crucial. Truth must make our love discriminating and love must make our truth compassionate and forgiving. If our actions are in accord, accordance with agape love, we will always welcome biblical truth and never resist it. Love bears all things. Here's a big one. The phrase bears all things comes from a Greek word meaning to cover something. It is related to the word for roof, a covering that often protects from the hostile elements. Okay, First Peter 4, 8 says that love covers a multitude of sin. And that is precisely the meaning here. Love protects other people. It does not broadcast bad news. It does not broadcast the mistakes of others. It goes the second mile to protect and to cover another person's reputation. Amen. The agape love of God will never seek to throw somebody under the bus, as we said before. There are two relevant applications here. First, love doesn't nitpick and, and doesn't point out every flaw of the ones you love. Secondly, love doesn't criticize in public. Amen. This is perhaps Paul's primary meaning here. Love doesn't do its dirty laundry for the whole world to see. It just doesn't do that. Love believes all things. This is beautiful too. Love is always ready to allow for extenuating circumstances, to give the other person the benefit of the doubt. Okay, to believe the best about everybody, to believe the best about someone. Many of us have de developed a certain distrust of people because of negative experiences, but love always trusts. It is always useful to remember that even in a court of law, the accused person is always innocent until proven guilty. Love says, I am willing to wait for the evidence to come in before making my decision. I choose to give you the benefit of the doubt as long as there a reason to do so. And then, of course, hope. Hope is such a beautiful word, and it's free. Love hopes all things. The third phrase of, uh, of 1 Corinthians 13, 7 tells us that love hopes all things. This is a simply a step beyond believing. The meaning is something like this. There are times in life when you face situations so difficult that faith is difficult. You would gladly give the benefit of the doubt, but there is none to give. So you search for that silver lining, but the angry clouds over you have no silver lining. But love has a positive forward look. So even in a most difficult circumstance, love is going to continue to dig and to trust and to hope and to believe and to protect and to persevere. Amen. Paul suggested that love refuses to take failure as final, either in oneself or in someone else. Amen. Love never gives up on people. Love never gives up. And the reason the believer can take such an attitude is that God is in the business of taking human failures and producing spiritual giants out of them. Amen. God is in the business of transforming and redeeming. Remember, we have talked so much uh, in these last two Christmas seasons about our Redeemer and the redemption of Jesus Christ. And of course, always hoping doesn't mean that we sit back and just watch God do his thing. Rather, it means that we get actively involved. God wants to work through us. He wants to work through the church. He wants to work through a husband to help a wife or through a wife to help a husband. God wants to work through us. Amen. That's always his uh, modus operandum, so to speak. Love hopes and expects the best. Love never loses faith in other people and gives up on them, but remains faithful to them despite their shortcomings. Boy, I am explaining love in the simplest way, but trying to do this in a short amount of time. Love endures all things. The word endures is a military term that means to hold a position at all cost, even unto death, whatever it takes. So love holds fast to people it loves. It perseveres. It never gives up on anyone. Love won't stop loving, even in the face of rejection. Even in the face of rejection, love takes action to shake up an intolerable situation. Love looks beyond the present to the hope of what might be in the future and always expects the best of somebody. Always expects the best. This love list defines God's 
gift of himself in Jesus Christ. What we have done here is just in these few short minutes, we've just described the nature of Jesus Christ. If you go back through these verses and everywhere you find the word love, substitute the word Christ. All these statements will still be true. Amen. The kind of love being described is love has its source in God. And as we look at each of the phrases, it becomes obvious that we are defining a lifestyle that really is beyond our human reach. It's not possible to do it without the saturation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is absolutely impossible unless we abide in Christ and we ask him to live his supernatural love in and through us. Well, that's all I'm going to share with you this morning. I'm just so excited about this revelation that God has been given me. And I know I've went over all this very quickly. And each one of these attributes deserves so much more time, so much more study. And we're going to do that as the Lord leads. And But the main thing is, I know it's my heart cry that I will apply personally everything that we have taught here concerning the agape love of God. And we're in the fifth section of this message now, and there will be at least maybe one or maybe more sections, I don't know, but uh, as the Holy Spirit leads, I, I just want everybody to receive encouragement, to receive help, and to receive strength, and to understand Jesus, and to be like Him. That's our heart cries as we go into this new year. God bless you all. We love you all. And uh, have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday. Bye for now.